Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to that portion of Scripture that I read just a moment ago, Exodus chapter 13, looking at verses 17 through 22. As we have noted over the last number of weeks, the wilderness wanderings are used in the New Testament to illustrate the doctrine of sanctification. And we have talked about the three different levels or areas of sanctification that are revealed in Scripture. You have positional sanctification. That is how God sees you in Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 deals with that, where you are in Christ, where God looks at you through the lens of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and sees you, as Romans 8 puts it, all the way to the state of glorification. And there's no leakage along the way. All the way from your election in eternity past, all the way to your glorification in eternity future. The second level of sanctification that we've been dealing with is positional or progressive sanctification. And that's what is going on now as God is working in time and space in each one of our lives to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. We do not become sinlessly perfect in this life. The scripture is very clear about that. First John chapter 1 verses 8 and 10 tell us that if we claim not to sin or to have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, the truth is not in us. But we are growing in Christ. Positional sanctification is, our, is how we are seen by God. Progressive sanctification is how we are living our lives today as the Holy Spirit transforms us into the image of Christ and develops in us the mind of Christ according to Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. Ultimate sanctification is what we have when we step out of this life and into eternity. When we're absent from the body and present with the Lord, we will not take any sin nature with us to heaven and we will not carry any of our sins with us to heaven. That's when we are ultimately sanctified, and we'll be talking about some of that today, but we're still looking at that central area, which is progressive sanctification, as we are going through life right now. Now, you recall that last week was Parents' Day, at least celebrated here in this church as that, because I was in China at the time Parents' Day rolled around, so we had that last week. So we're back to the way of the wilderness, but today we are going to be talking about the way of the wilderness and war. And you saw, as we read in our verses today in Exodus chapter 13, verses 17 and following, God did not lead them into war initially as they were going into the wilderness wanderings. Instead, God was teaching them some very practical things. He was training them to learn to trust him. It was only after they had been through that initial part, which is used as an illustration in the New Testament of sanctification, of the teaching and training ministry of the Holy Spirit in their lives to learn to obey God, to learn to trust him, and how they rebelled ten different times, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And God finally said, okay, now we move to the second generation. And all of that first generation, except Joshua and Caleb, who were age 20 and above, at the time of the Exodus, God killed them in the wilderness. Very serious business as we look at that first training part. And then they entered warfare. Then they ran into the Amalekites. Then they had to cross the River Jordan. Then they had to do battle with all the people of the land, the giants of the land that were there. And that's the second stage of progressive sanctification where you're intensely engaged in spiritual warfare. We'll be talking about that a little bit later on. The cleansing work of the Holy Spirit of God and progressive sanctification is very beautifully portrayed for us in the wilderness wanderings. The many tests that God gave to Israel, the conquest of the land, the tests in the wilderness were designed to portray for us the initial aspects of sanctification that relate to learning to trust God that he will never leave us, that he will never forsake us. Those last verses that we read just a moment ago, how God went before them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And then it tells us in the last verse, he took not away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. The book of Hebrews puts it this way, that he will never leave us nor forsake us. We have a God who is always there. 
He doesn't abandon us in the wilderness. We go through wilderness times in our lives. We go through those periods where we don't seem to have any food, don't seem to have any water spiritually. We seem to be wandering through the blazing heat and there doesn't seem to be any direction, but God's presence is always with us. But you know, the fact that God killed the children of Israel because of their rebellion is designed according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 to be an example for us in the church. Most of the people failed that test in the wilderness. They rebelled against God 10 times in their wilderness training, and so God ultimately killed all of them who'd been 20 years old and older at the Exodus. It's a warning to Bible Presbyterian Church. That's what happens to God's people when they rebel in the way of the wilderness, their time of training or practical or progressive sanctification. We looked, as you recall, two weeks ago at Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 and following. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept for that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would to God that we had died in the land of Egypt, would to God that we died in the wilderness. God finally said to them, Okay, you'll, I'll give you your wish. <laughs> you didn't get to die in Egypt, but I'll let you have that second part of the wish. I'm going to let you die in the wilderness. And he did. They never made it into the land of promise, never made it into the land of blessing. They complained and said, Well, this if we try to cross into the land now, the, the giants will kill our wives and children. God said, no, it'll be your children who take the land. You're going to die, but your kids will get the land. And the only two who stood against it were Joshua and Caleb. Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were among them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it, it's an exceedingly good land. The Lord delight in us, and he will bring us into this land and give it to us. A land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for their bread for us. Their defense is departed from them. The Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? How long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs that I have showed among them? I will smite them with a pestilence. I will disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. You think God was angry with Israel? I think he was. Were they his chosen people? Yes, they were. Had he called them out of Egypt? Yes, he had. Had he done a supernatural miracle in crossing the Red Sea after he had done the ten plagues of Egypt, which they had seen with their own eyes? Yes, he did. Had he provided for them continually in the wilderness, wandering? Yes, he had. Food when they needed it, water when they needed it. Protection. Their sandals didn't wear out for 40 years. Every morning when they got up and put on their sandals, they saw the provision of God. Every day when they went out and collected manna and, uh, outside in the tents, they brought it in, they saw God's provision. These things are written for us upon whom the ends of the world have come. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10. There are examples for us that we shouldn't fall into the same kind of sins that they fell into. We'll talk about those sins in just a second. They all wanted a stone. Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and Caleb, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And God wanted to curse them and disinherit them. And Moses, the meekest man on the face of the earth, according to Scripture, begged God not to do it. Moses could have been the next one just like Abraham. God says, I'll kill the rest of them and I'll make you a great nation. I'll multiply your children. Moses said, please don't do it because your name is at stake. All the nations around will hear that you, the living God, weren't able to bring this stubborn people out of the land and into the land that you promised them. They were too much for you. Your name is at stake. And so God said, all right, I won't do it that way, but I'm going to kill all those who are adults who came out of Egypt. I'm going to kill them. And nobody's going to enter the land until they're dead. And then their children, who they thought the giants would eat, 
their children will take the land. I look at a lot of empty pews here. I wonder what happened to that intermediate generation. Because all the men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened unto my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. That brings us to the way of the wilderness in war, part one. That passage I just referenced a moment ago, if you have your Bibles, please open them. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It tells us five specific things that they did why God killed them in the wilderness. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, that's the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory, and all passed through the sea, there's the crossing of the Red Sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And by the way, baptism there doesn't mean that they got wet. The people who got wet were the Egyptians. Baptizo relates to the identification with Moses and the cloud and in the sea. They became a nation at that point. And did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. When the waters poured out of the rock, when Moses smote the rock, it tells us that that rock was Christ. And Jesus himself said in the Gospel of John, if you're thirsty, come to me for drink. He said that to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. He cried it out at the great feast. And the, the waters pour out from me, the Holy Spirit, says Jesus. That rock was Christ. He was the one leading them through the wilderness. Oh, there's so much marvelous picture in this, but we must go on. But with many of them, <laughs> many is not an understatement, is it? With many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. God said, I'm going to kill them, and he did. Now look at verse 6. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be you idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted. Tempted who? Tempted Christ. They tempted Christ and were destroyed of serpents. He's taking you through the different events of what happened in the wilderness wanderings. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Ten times they murmured. We just read that out of Numbers. Then he says it again, verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. Verse 6, he said, these are our examples. Now he says they happened unto them for an example they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. You get the idea? Why did God record that stuff? It wasn't for them, they're dead. He recorded it for us. He recorded it so we will understand how a holy God who expects obedience treats those who disobey against him after he has poured out immense amounts of grace, immense amounts of mercy, immense amounts of resources, immense amounts of guiding and leading and protection. How does the living God deal with his own children? Whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. That means you're illegitimate. You're not sons of the Father. That means you're not one of God's children. If you never get chastened, if you never get spanked by the Heavenly Father, it means you are not one of his children. So if you can continue to live in sin, if you can continue to do the same things and get away with it, you better ask yourself whether or not you're reprobate or whether or not you are in the faith. Because God spanks his kids. By the way, that's what parents, fathers especially, are supposed to do with their children when they rebel, if they love them. 
the Bible says so. Yeah, I know. Child Protective Services will get after you. And, you know, people say you're child abusing and all that. God says you spank your kids because otherwise they may end up in hell. Oh, my, there's much in this. These things happen unto them for examples, and they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So you think you're doing okay? Look at verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Pride goes before destruction. Haughty spirit goes before fall. Unless you have the humility to realize there are problems in your own life and I in mine, we're going to fall. Verse 13. There's, here's the promise. It's a threefold promise in verse 13. When you're faced with the test, when you're faced with the temptation, when you want to murmur and gripe and complain, when you want to commit the five different sins that are listed in the preceding verses, we'll go over those in just a second, here's the promise of God. There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. The first guarantee that God gives to us is you will never have and I will never have a unique temptation. In fact, it won't even be a rare temptation. It will be a common temptation. You know what? <laughs> The Bible tells you how to deal with common temptations. All the way through, all the stuff that hits us in our daily walk, it's in here and it tells you what happened to people who did it. It tells you how to avoid it. It gives you the guaranteed promise of the indwelling Holy Spirit who will empower you, enable you not to fall for it. That's number one. Every temptation is a common temptation. Then number two, but God is faithful. Oh my, we can rely on that, can't we? God's faithful. We're not, but God is. We wishy-washy, but God stands firm. We compromise, but God has an absolute standard. God is faithful, who will not suffer you, that is, will not allow you or permit you, to be tempted above that you are able. Wow, that's a great one because you know every one of us is at a different level in our spiritual life. Each one of us has a different level of maturity. There are some who are brand new babes in Christ. There are some who have been Christians for 40 or 50 years. And maybe here in this church for 132 years. I'm delighted how many older folks we have here. But whatever your level, God guarantees that the temptation will not be stronger than your level of spiritual growth. Now let me pause for just a second. What are we talking about? We're talking about the wilderness wanderings. That was what in our text here. We've talked about how God brings us through that first part of the wilderness wanderings in progressive sanctification as he is purifying us, as he's getting the, the sludge of Egypt out of us, as he's teaching us to learn to trust him, as he's teaching us to learn that he will provide, as he's teaching us to walk by faith, as he's teaching us to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit instead of walking in the power of the flesh. That's the first part of the wilderness wanderings. You're going to go through them. If you haven't ever hit any wilderness wanderings, you might want to know whether or not you've ever gotten out of Egypt. Because God leads his children through the wilderness wanderings so they'll learn to walk by faith. That is, learn to trust him. That's what we just read in our text in Exodus. That's what Paul's referring to here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So if you are a 90-pound weakling who can only press 10 pounds, the world, the flesh, and the devil will never be able to drop more than 9.9 .9 pounds upon you as you're trying to lift it up. If you're a, a muscle-bound oaf who can press 400 pounds, the devil will never be able to drop more than 399.9 .9 pounds on top of you. It says so, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. Never say, the devil made me do it. No, the devil didn't make you do it. You gave way to the flesh and let the devil do it. Because God is faithful. As that stuff comes crashing down at you and the devil's trying to pour the whole kitchen sink on you, God knocks off everything that you can't handle which means that you are accountable if you yield to that temptation. It was not too strong for you. At your level of spiritual growth, it was not too strong for you. We get to the third promise at the end of verse 13. But will, that is God will, with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. 
Some of us don't like the way of escape that God makes for us. We would like to ride out in style in a, a Cadillac limousine uh, to get out of the city in broad daylight with all the crowds waving and cheering. God may cause you to crawl through a sewer to get out of that temptation, just like some of the World War II prisoners had to do. And they got out, even though it wasn't very fancy. God will always make a way to escape if you're willing to take it. If your flesh doesn't rise up and say, I'm too proud for that way of escape, I'd have to humble myself if I took that way of escape. Now, folks, that's in the context of what the children of Israel did in the wilderness and why God judged them and killed them. And there are five sins listed. Go back for a few verses. First thing was lust, chapter 6. And, not, and that's not just sexual lust, because he mentions fornication in the next verse. Remember, they bellyache because they had this manna, which means, what's this? Mana. What's this? It was angels' food, we're told in Scripture. And they griped about eating angels' food. They lusted after meat, and God gave them quails. And while it was still in their mouth, he killed a bunch of them. They wanted to satisfy all the different lusts of the flesh. They were also involved in sexual immorality. Fornication. Neither of us commit fornication as some of them committed, and in one day fell 23,000. If you're fooling around with sex, you're in serious trouble with God. And he uses fornication, which covers everything from adultery all the way down to the stuff that's being promoted by our current government. They tempted Christ. I, oh, I lift a skipped one, sorry, verse at 7. Idolaters. You know what the Bible says in Colossians 3.5 and Ephesians 5.5? It defines idolatry for us. It says covetousness is idolatry. And the covetous man is an idolater. That's how God looks at it. Look it up for yourself. Colossians 3.5, Ephesians 5.5. Are you a hoarder? Are you one of these people who just has to pack it into the bank? Man, you've got to have as much money as you can and it's still not enough. You're covetous, you see this car, you see that boat, or you see that those clothing. you always got to be shopping for clothes. And you're piling things up and piling them up and piling them up. Maybe you're too poor for it, but you still covet it. Covetousness is idolatry. Neither let us be idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Oh, idolatry can also be entertainment, can't it? Having fun. It's your focus on sports. Where's your really place your heart? Lust, idolatry, fornication. They tempted Christ. They put him for the test. That's where they say, I wonder if I can hang one hairy little foot over the line and see what he'll do about it. Putting God to the test. Did God really say that? Let's see. Hmm. You stick it over the line. Have you ever put God to the test? Well, I don't know if the Bible really teaches that. Let's, let's, let's see what happens if I do it. Oh, and the big one. Murmuring, verse 10. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. A lot of complaining goes on in the church. And with it, a lot of gossip. Folks, those are deadly sins. God killed people for them. Yeah. Now, as we look at that, God tells us, we know for sure, the reason that God killed them in the wilderness, because the New Testament tells us very bluntly. Did you know that all five of those sins, everything that's listed here in this passage, God called their failure a failure of faith. A failure of faith. We call it other things, but God boils it down to one key sin, disbelief. Listen to it in Hebrews chapter 3, talking about the exact same thing that Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 10. Hebrews chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, if today you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, 
and saw my works 40 years. So we don't have to guess that this applies to the wilderness wanderings. Just like Paul said, those were examples for us. Now the book of Hebrews is taking us over there and he's going to explain to us, he's going to summarize for us what happened. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation. Forty years in scripture is a generation. Just a couple of years ago, we passed our 75th anniversary here. First generation is basically gone. We're in the second generation of this church. Only a couple of years to go to see whether or not the spiritual warfare will be a win or lose. Wherefore I was grieved of that generation and said they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Now here it applies to us. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of, now here's a key, an evil heart of unbelief. We found five specific sins listed over in 1 Corinthians. Here it's summarized for us as an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You think you're okay. You think you're okay. You know, sin is a liar. It will deceive you all it possibly can. Verse 14, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, Today, if you will hear his voice, don't put it off till tomorrow, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. The sin of unbelief does something. It turns your heart to stone. The longer, the longer you continue to resist, as the children of Israel did, you're showing you do not believe who the true and living God is and that he judges sin. You're putting him to the test. You're doing different types of sins to see what are you going to do about it. That's disbelief in what he's revealed in his word. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Three times in a row he's going to say that. Don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. There were at least two guys who didn't. You know, it's not very good. One in a million. I don't think you'd want to bet those odds. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses, I like that word, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that, here it is, believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. The issue was faith. Genuine faith always precedes works of righteousness and genuine faith always produces works of righteousness. Remember the two Ps? I gave that to you in an outline three or four weeks ago. You don't work your way to heaven. Genuine faith will precede works of genuine righteousness. Do you remember the test for works of righteousness? I gave you what the scripture calls righteous works. And it always produces works that are done in obedience to the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God and not in the power of the flesh. Those are works of righteousness. We see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Back to the text there in Numbers chapter 14. God's still speaking, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereunto he went, and his seed shall possess it. 
Now you know, as all this is happening, they're being watched by the pagans. Dear people, do you know that you are always being watched by the pagans? There are angels here, of course. The Bible says so, watching the assembly of the believers. But you are being watched by the pagans to see whether or not you really have a living God. And if you do, how has he changed your life? That's my question always. You say you're a Christian. So how has it changed your life? God takes you as you are, but he does not leave you as you are. He transforms you day by day by the Spirit of God because you are his representatives in this world. The pagans were watching them. Listen to the next verse. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelt in the valley. End of the parenthesis. Tomorrow turn you and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur against me. You know, Moses had told them that. They murmured against Moses. Moses said, Look, you haven't murmured against me. You've murmured against the Lord. You don't like the preacher. You're not murmuring against the preacher. You're murmuring against the Lord who put him there. Be very careful. When they murmured against Moses, they were murmuring against God. They said, God, you don't know what you're doing. God, you should have given us somebody better. You should have given us somebody more charismatic. You should have given us somebody, you know, who could really draw the crowds. Saying to them, as I truly live, saith the Lord, you have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. You wanted to die in the wilderness? Okay, here it is. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all of you that were numbered of you, according to your whole number from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning the which I swear you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones, which you should say would be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness." And your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which you searched the land, even forty days, each day for a year ye shall bear your iniquities, even forty years, and you shall know my breach of promise. Whoa. One day of disobedience and one year of punishment? God takes things seriously, doesn't he? After the number of the days in which you search the land, even 40 days a day for a year, you shall bear your iniquities. Even 40 years and you shall know my breach of promise. I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there shall they die. And the men which Moses sent to search the land who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a slander upon the land, even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died before the, by the plague before the Lord. God killed them that day. But he said, the rest of you, because you went along with them, you're going to die over the next 40 years. You're not going to get into land. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of the men that went to search the land, lived still. And Moses told these sayings unto all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. And they rose up early in the morning and got them up to the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and we'll go up into the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. Well, they did this, but a little bit too late. Did you know there comes a point of no return, even when you repent? We saw that already with Esau over in the book of Hebrews. Esau sold his birthright for a morsel of bean soup. And afterward, when he repented, he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So the scripture says, Jacob had gotten the blessing. And he says, that's a warning for you too, lest there be any fornicator or profane person such as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. And he couldn't get it back. He repented! But he couldn't get the blessing back. That's what God is telling the children of Israel. Here they are repenting. They are admitting they sinned. We've sinned. You know, David repented of his sin with Bathsheba. But the child still died. 
Folks, there are temporal consequences to sin. Now, in eternity, we have forgiveness, but we lose heavenly rewards that we do not ever get because we threw them away. Forgiveness restores you to fellowship with God. But it does not restore blessings that you may have lost. There will be other blessings that you can attain, but you may have thrown something away that you will never get back. The scripture is serious. The people said, we have sinned. David said, I have sinned. And Moses said, Wherefore now do you transgress the commandment of the Lord, but it shall not prosper? See, they decided, okay, God said go in and take the land. Okay, we didn't want to. We rebelled against God. He killed the spies. It looks like we're in trouble. But we better say, let's go in and take the land. And Moses said, it's too late. You're not going to get it. You won't be able to get into the land. Believe me. It shall not prosper. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that you be not smitten before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword, because ye turned away from the Lord. Therefore the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up unto the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Then the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites which dwelt in that hill and smote them and discomfited them even unto Hormah. Now back to 1 Corinthians and Hebrews. It told us these things are examples for us so that we wouldn't fall into the same kind of specific sins that are listed but then which are categorized all together for us in Hebrews as the sin of disbelief. When you fail to walk through the wilderness wanderings, which God leads us all through, we all go through periods of wilderness so that we might learn to trust the living God to provide for us. And if we don't learn to trust him, it is the spirit of disbelief. It is a denial of walking by faith. It is a denial of walking in the spirit when we choose to walk in the flesh. I can't believe it, our time is up. I wanted to talk about the next generation, the generation that was spared from dying in the wilderness wanderings. They had their shot at it too, and we're going to talk about what happened. They have also additional things that they illustrate for us because they had to illustrate the aspect of spiritual warfare when they got to the promised land. Canaan's not a picture of heaven. Canaan is a spiritual warfare land. We don't have to conquer giants when we get to heaven. Canaan is not heaven. Canaan is a picture of spiritual warfare in the process of progressive and practical sanctification. But we're going to have to stop there and continue next week. I told you today is only part one of spiritual warfare, the way of the wilderness and the war. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for its power. Your word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know us inside even when we have a good veneer. You know whether or not they're termites rotting out our innards, rotting the woodway so that there is nothing solid under that shiny surface that beams in church. You know the truth. And because you are a God who is a just and holy God, you will expose the truth. You will cause us to understand and others to understand our own sinful condition. You're not playing games with us because you want your people to be a holy people. Be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You've called us to holiness and purity, to righteousness. And in this sanctifying process through which we are going, you lead us through the wilderness to learn to trust you and you enable us to learn to do battle so that we might be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, to be yours 100%, without compromise, standing from the faith, for the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for the encouragement of other believers who may be wavering in their faith. We pray these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 